Okay, we'll get started now, it's 10 o'clock. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Peter O'Rourke, Executive Director of NAPSIG Foundation. Um, thank you very much for participating in this um, quarterly prep tech talk. I'm really excited about the presentation today um, and looking forward to um, any questions you might have. We're gonna try something a little different than we have in the past, um, where we are actually gonna try to open up participant questions for live questions. We will monitor the Q&A, but during the presentation, uh, Vanessa and Bull might ask you for um, uh, any feedback or questions or commentary you might have and raise your hand in the, um, in the um, uh, rate hand raising function you'll see at the bottom of the screen and we'll unmute you so we can have a bit of a dialogue. Um, might be a little clunky because we haven't done that as much in the past, but we're really looking forward to trying that for this particular session. <clears throat> so without further ado, I'll introduce our um, trainers for today. Um, first um, person we will um, introduce is Dr. Bull Holland. He is the director at Hacking for Homeland Security, H4X training, and he's an adjunct professor at um, North Carolina State University. Um, and also joining Bull is Vanessa Zabala, who is program manager for Hacking for Homeland Security and Hacking for Diplomacy at BMNT, which is an innovative consulting firm. The title of this um, training session is Hacking for Homeland Security, Lean Innovation Training. And without further ado, I'll mute myself and turn it over to Vanessa to start us off. Wonderful, thank you, Peter. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, like Peter said, my name is Vanessa Zabala. And so uh, just to give you uh, an idea of what we're gonna go through today, so first I'll be exposing you to this program that is already funded by the Department of Homeland Security. And then we'll go into the details of how this program uses innovation frameworks and then actually uh, get you uh, more, more insight into how that truly works and how you could possibly apply it. And that's where Bull will come in. So just to, to give you the cadence of uh, what I'll be exposing you first, uh, a program that you have the option to engage with uh, that uses the methodology that Bull will be going over. Um, okay, so Hacking for Homeland Security is an accredited, accredited university course funded by DHS S&T. Uh, it pretty much gets uh, challenges or problems from uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, mainly from the employees, and uh, gives them to universities and for graduate students to work on that problem for an entire semester. They use uh, what we call lean or innovation frameworks, uh, which is what Bull is going to go over, which is pretty much hypothesis testing every assumption and idea that you have around what is the actual problem, what's the fail and success criteria for any solution, and then which solutions would uh, be a best fit for that and how do we test it? Uh, so that's pretty much what the students do. And obviously they work with the uh, employee, the DHS employee that submitted that challenge and that problem in order to guide the students through uh, how the organization works uh, and then be able to integrate the solution that they come up with after the semester. So uh, what this has really done, um, these are some quotes you'll see from previous problem sponsors from, from FEMA specifically. Um, it gives you uh, new ideas and solutions. The students not only give you the business case of why this problem is important because they do usually around 50 to 100 interviews. So they give you a lot of data to say why this is important and then what, it's need, what is needed in order for a solution to be integrated. Uh, obviously it's a fresh perspective uh, since they are not from the organization itself uh, and what we found is that this also creates an understanding of potential careers within FEMA. So we actually had a semester at the Colorado School of Mines, and we now have two students are working full time in Region 8. And they told us that they would have never even considered it if it wasn't for this course. And because they got to do about 100 informational interviews, they got to see the different career pathways that people can take within an organization like FEMA. Uh, so I think that's pretty. Pretty cool. Uh, some testimonials here, since you'll be getting these slides, I'm not gonna read through it, but pretty much this is saying from a previous problem sponsor, it's a great program. I'm a little biased, so you know, this uh, slide always is useful. Um, 
and that you know it's worth it. So how it works, just to recap really quick, we get uh, challenges or problem statements from people like you. So it, it's not just only uh, FEMA employees, but also partner organizations. We'd only ask that you partner with a DHS employee, so with a D FEMA employee, but that could be kind of like what we call co-sponsoring. Uh, and then that can go to the university. Again, this is already funded. The main thing that we, would, we ask is that um, if, you are, if you do wanna engage this program, uh, that you engage with the students uh, one to three hours a week. So that's to for them to gather that data that we talked about for hypothesis testing, uh, and that that's you referring them to people that they can speak to, and then coaching them through how the organization actually works. So that's uh, the students using the entrepreneurial framework, and then integrating those solutions. And obviously, that also leads to potential career opportunities. So if you also have like an internship or uh, potential uh, opportunities, uh, that's also an easy way to get them exposed. Uh, right now, we are uh, we actually just moved the deadline for the fall 2022 to this Friday. Uh, either way, we're having a spring semester, so that deadline is uh, in November uh, to submit the problem. But if you think of something that you know that the students can work on, uh, then you know, feel free to reach out to me and then we can decide if it's appropriate for this upcoming semester or the next one. Oh, so uh, there, uh, this program uh, is a spin out from uh, Hacking for Defense, uh, which was created in 2015. It's had so much success that now we started this one in 2020. Uh, we are growing. Last semester, we had two problems go through uh, to, univer to universities, and now this upcoming semester, we're having eight. So as you can see, we are growing, uh, but it does help if you have any challenges to submit to show that there is demand for uh, the continuation of a program like this. Uh, and I think the neatest part about this is that 90% of all we call problem sponsor, which is the DHS employees that have submitted a problem to uh, the Hacking for Homeland Security pro uh, program. 90% uh, that have engaged this program say that they're actually doing something either with the findings and then uh, and changing policy, or they're actually getting the solution and implementing it right now. Uh, here are some challenges, uh, challenges that were submitted for the upcoming semester. Uh, and these are highlighted in the different colors to showcase who the main beneficiary is, the pain point, and the outcome. So uh, for example, uh, Region 8 is needing a way to assess long-term economic impact of small cities, of, of disasters in small cities to allocate government disaster preparement resources effectively. So this is actually something that uh, the uh, FEMA employee was saying that They've hit their head against the wall so many times. It's not a super high priority, but it would have such a high impact if something like this was solved. So that's the kind of problem that we're really looking for. Something that you know, you're not already hiring a consultant, but it would make quite a big of a difference. It's something that's been annoying you for a while. And this is something that the students can take for a full semester, give you the business case of why it's that important to solve and some solution options to integrate as well. Um, so this is what we do in the process of if you want to submit uh, a, uh, a challenge statement, well, uh, we just refine it to make it more actionable. Don't want to boil the ocean. We can boil a cup in a semester, not the entire ocean. So that's what this process is. Um, the universities for fall is Texas A&M and Rochester Institute of Technology. And then, like I said, in spring, the deadline is more in October. Uh, we're defining the universities right now, but uh, you get the point. Uh, I just want to go through one example. There's a bunch in here that you'll get. Uh, but this one, I thought it was really neat because this was getting power uh, after disasters happen to people in more remote areas. How do you actually do that? So this team actually did over 100 informational interviews. And uh, they, as you can see, they partnered with not just FEMA, but CISA. There were all other components that had this issue as well. And they came up with an understanding that uh, of what was needed in order to get power to certain communities. So they came up with um, essentially a, a drone, but a very specific one. So this was uh, an example of 
the uh, the student team didn't create the solution themselves, but it was actually in the marketplace. So once the students have that all that data and that business case built, they do market research to see if it already exists, a solution already exists. If not, they create it themselves. Uh, and just to let you know, this upcoming semester, because we're working with Texas A&M and Rochester Institute of Technology, these are mainly engineering computer science students. Uh, there's plenty of semesters where sometimes we have more policy oriented. Next semester, for example, we're looking to work with the University of Puerto Rico and their Department of Architecture and Design. So if you have those kinds of problems, uh, for example, TSA had a, an issue with um, the wheelchairs are getting bigger but the space for the lines and the queues in security checkpoints aren't getting bigger. So how do you design a way so that it doesn't backstop and backlog the, the, the line, uh, the security line at the airports? So that's just one example. Uh, but that you can also, you know, put an architecture design project on uh, how do you uh, potentially build up temporary housing very quickly with renewable materials or whatever it may be. Uh, so the, each semester, as we announce the universities, if you just want to sign up for just um, alerts, uh, when we have new information to send, uh, feel free to email me and I'll make sure to put my uh, email in the chat. So the sponsors will say, OK, I have an idea of a, a problem or a challenge that I want to submit for graduate students to work on. What you're committing to is one to three hours uh, of work with the students. It ebbs and flows. Uh, and mainly your responsibility is to introduce them to people because that's the only way that they actually advance through the course, through that data gathering, and then coaching uh, and giving them feedback so that they understand how the organization works. You know, it is a, uh, um, a student team that uh, most likely has never worked with uh, DHS. So uh, that kind of guidance is useful. Uh, so this is the roadmap, kind of we already went over it, we gather the challenges, there's the deadline, then we send them to the universities, and the student teams are the ones that actually choose uh, which problems they're going to uh, work through, uh, since they need to have a vested interest and, and care <laughs> uh, to actually go through it. If your problem is not selected, it is automatically put for next semester, we check with you to see if that's okay. Either way, like I said, this builds up our case to keep growing the program and have instead of eight problems, 12 or 50 problems a semester that we can put through. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll put, I'll stop sharing now. If you guys have any questions, let me know. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and as I said, you know, Bull is going to go over how this actually works within the course. It's not just for students. We do this at the innovation consulting company. There's a lot of private companies that use it as well as public agencies. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there, uh, see if anybody has any questions, uh, and then if not, I'll uh, lead it off to Bo. Great, and Bo, we'll have you share your screen and kickstart, and we'll keep an eye on any questions. Okay, Bo, you ready? The unmute button moved, so I had to go find it, All right? Hey, I'm, I'm Bo Holland. I'm the director of H4X training at EMNT. And so today, in about 15 minutes, I'm gonna teach you all the things you all ever need to know about innovation. Um, so short course, nothing. <laughs> not not too intense. Actually, actually, we're just going to talk about the difference really in what we mean by innovation and what we typically see, which is innovation theater. So I really want this to be an interactive discussion. I only have four slides and this is one of them. So we, we've got opportunity to have a rich conversation or not. Let's see what happens. That's really my goal for this first part of the presentation is to talk about what it is we mean when we say innovation. So of course, when we talk about innovation, we mean something new, we mean something modern. So we should start in the 1560s with Sir Francis Bacon, because what Bacon did is he really developed the scientific method that we've used ever since. And the key to what he did 
that is opposed to, as opposed to what the Galileo Galilei was doing and, and many others, is that while the other um, natural philosophers of their time, we didn't call them scientists back then, were observing the world and then collecting information, what they weren't doing is hypothesizing. And that's what Bacon's real addition to science was, is the idea of inductive reasoning. It's the idea that I saw this happen and then I saw it happen again and then I saw it happen again. So I think when this happens, that happens. And that's the essence of science. I've, uh, I've talked quite a bit about the difference between science and technology, and we can just focus on the science piece here. The, the essence of science is the relationship between two phenomena. Force equals mass times acceleration. Increase the mass, increase the force. Decrease the acceleration, decrease the force. It's all about those relationships, and that's what a hypothesis really is. That's what Bacon gave us. What drove him to this is about this time is when we were discovering biology. We finally had the optics to take a look at microorganisms and a lot of observations were happening. But what no one, none of these natural philosophers could do is they could say, what is truth? I saw this, you saw that. How do we know one from the other? So he developed an entire model for this. But the piece that I want to focus on here to help understand when we say innovation, what's different? is this idea of inductive reasoning. If you aren't hypothesizing, it's actually really hard to make a good hypothesis, testable, falsifiable, then you aren't doing scientific research or scientific analysis. Now look, when we talk to people about scientific research, we ain't publishing in nature here, okay? We're not worried about um, an alpha of 0.05. We're not looking for sufficient statistical power. We're looking for evidence that gives us enough confidence to start making investments and decisions about where to apply resources. And I believe that that transfers well to the work that FEMA does, because at the end of the day, at the top level, what you have to do is figure out how do you get the right resources and capabilities, which really means human beings with the right training and skills to the right place at the right time. We're gonna talk about an example at the end that I hope relates some of the things we discuss here about how and why we think those same principles of innovation could apply. So we're gonna skip all the way from the 1560s up to not too many years ago. And an author uh, named uh, Nassim Tlaib, he wrote a book you may have heard of called The Black Swan. And he reintroduced kind of into the public lexicon this idea of inductive reasoning. Technically he got into abductive reasoning, but we really don't wanna have a discussion on logic and philosophy this morning, right? So he brings back this idea of inductive reasoning, but he brings it into risk management. That's going to tie into another topic we talk about in just a minute. And what, uh, what Tlaib's real complaint was, was that um, all the people who worked in the financial markets where he worked would say, look, our models work perfectly well if you just ignore 1929 and 2008. Everything fits the model exactly right. And his whole point was, <laughs> that's the problem. Your models ignore reality and you base the idea that all your risk calculations work on the idea that all the events are normally distributed. And that just doesn't match reality either. So when I was uh, working as, in a scientific position at the Army Research Lab, we got this task down from our higher headquarters and it said someone had, you know, the book had been out not that long. Someone gave us a task that says the Army Research Lab's job is to predict black swans, right? So they made the mistake of giving me this, this problem. And so my answer was step one, read the book, right? Because Tlaib's entire point was you don't predict the black swan. What you can do as an organization is be anti-fragile. And when I see the things that, and the processes that NEMA, uh, excuse me, that FEMA is working to put in place, then I see an organization that is attempting to achieve that goal. And I think that if we apply some principles of innovation, we can help accelerate and maintain and continue to stay uh, ahead of and in contact with the disasters that can't be predicted, but we can become anti-fragile. So I talked about risk management and there's a term that's used in innovation often and it's called the minimum viable product. It's probably the least well understood, mis most misused concept we have. And it's not, uh, that's not a problem because those of us who use the term in teaching get frustrated that our syntax gets used by someone who doesn't know what they're doing. It's a problem because this is what we do in the government. 
I was in the army for 23 years. Uh, most of it is a soldier, some is a civilian. Stop me if you've heard this. Um, oh, that new idea, that new thing. Yeah, turns out we've been doing that all along. We just called it something different. So sure, innovation, we've always done innovation. We know that minimum viable product. Absolutely, we've been doing minimal viable products for decades. We know exactly how to do this. There's a point to what I want to tell you about why what we do in industry is different than the way the government typically does it. And there are three people here that I want to talk about around this one concept of the minimum viable product. The first, and the first is the person who really brought the idea to life, and that's Mr. Frank Robinson, about 2000, 2001, a software developer, right? So if you've ever written any code, then the logical way to do this is you build the whole, in an object-oriented or service-oriented architecture, you build the whole floor, the foundation, the architecture, right? You got to build the data layer, you got to build the security layer, and then you'll build the individual services that will call back in your seven-layer OSI model, and then you build the user interface, right? Now, that means that you build a lot of code that everything else has to rely on before you get anything out the door. But it's still a logical way for a programmer to start doing this. Robinson said, that doesn't make any sense at all. Look, you're, you're spending a bunch of money before you even know whether or not you've gotten the product features out that your customers want. So if you imagine an x-axis that could be software lines of code or time and a y-axis that could be revenue or uh, ROI, then what Robinson said is, no, pick the product features that most of your customers want, build that out first and get it out the door, then build out the rest of what you need. And it was a really logical premise. He alluded to the idea of getting feedback from people about those product features, but it wasn't the sole purpose. The purpose was get the return on investment first instead of spending years at possibly building out this entire infrastructure before you get the things you already know people want out there. Well, then um, the next person we really see pushing some of these ideas forward is Mr. Steve Blank. Now, Vanessa and I know Steve, probably the friendliest, most user-friendly billionaire you'll ever meet, right? He, he is known as the godfather of Silicon Valley. His, uh, his website's amazing. He's uh, got an incredible history, and he's really the the person who pushed the ideas that led to hacking for defense and, and what he was doing in Lean Launchpad, Stanford, and Columbia, and Berkeley years ago. So what Steve does is that based on his experience as an entrepreneur, he takes Robinson's idea of the MVP and he says, yep, get something out there to the customer, but the purpose of getting it to the cu customer is not to hit this high ROI, it's to get feedback is to begin that iterative loop that we're going to talk about in just a minute that is really the essence of any methodology we talk about in the space of innovation. So that's a key change and key innovation. Steve moves from looking at this as a business proposition to moving into the idea of using a minimum viable product as a way to learn how you're going to go back and change the code, not just the code, but change the product features, figure out what your customers actually need. Now, before I go on to talk about how Eric Ries fits in that, I want to make this distinction between customers and beneficiaries, right? A customer has a choice, a beneficiary doesn't. And, and that's the space we live in in the government, whether you're in the army, whether you're in FEMA, or if you're in a lot of not-for-profit spaces, you're trying to do the best you can for someone, but it's not like they have a marketplace to choose from. So, all the things we've talked about to this point have been about customers, people, whether it's a business to business relationship or a business to customer relationship, people who actually have free choice of what to do with their resources. And so that's who can give you good feedback. The next person who comes along and moves minimum bioproduct to the space where Vanessa and I use it in what we engage with is Eric Reese, who's a student of Steve Blank. And what Reese said is, Feedback, yes, but you don't have to wait to get a product out the door. I can hypothesize that if I give you this, it will do that. And I can draw a sketch on a napkin and say, hey, would this work for you? And after I get past the sketch on a napkin and I can say, well, if I'm building software, what if I just build a front end user interface and say, if I gave you this and you could push this button and get this data, would that solve this problem for you? And you get a lot of feedback that says, yeah, yeah, but mostly what you want is no, no, that doesn't work at all. 
right? People will tell you yes, just because they don't want to talk to you anymore. The people you want to listen to are the people who tell you no. I'll give you a great example that Steve gives from one of his classes. He had a group of students going through um, his Lean Launchpad course, and they had this great idea for a, a small business because Steve is teaching entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs at Stanford who go on to become pretty successful. And they said, you know what we could do? Um, we could put a hyperspectral camera on a drone. We could fly it over farmers' fields in California, and we could help them understand their irrigation patterns, where their water is going and where it's needed, right? So what did they do? They went out and they, they got a drone and they got a camera and they started to fly it. And then through the class, Steve said, wait a minute, what is it you want to learn with this drone? Well, we want to show them how it works. Yeah, but they're not going to pay you for the drone, right? No, 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 we're, we're going to give them information. Well, why don't you show them an example of the information and see if that's what they really want? So stop buying the drone, stop connecting it to the camera, built a spreadsheet, said, hey, Farmer Jones, here's your farm and all your different sections. And if we gave you this data on water with these mocked up heat maps from satellite imagery, would this give you what you want? And most of the Farmer Joneses said, no, <laughs> I don't need that at all. I've already got another way to get that. But you know what? If you could give me this data, that would be a big problem solver. So now they can go back and they actually got to put their hyperspectral camera on a drone, but they changed their whole idea of a business model. They moved from um, a service company that was going to pay for hours flying Jones, uh, drones to a service company that was going to sell subscription services for information for farmers so they can understand how to make the most efficient use of the water they have. That's the idea that we use now in a minimum viable product. And that's the idea that I want to convey to you about why, when we say innovation, we mean something genuinely different. When I say innovation, I mean modern industry business practices. Modern industry business practices is a mouthful, so we say innovation, right? The last thing I want to talk to you about is this key principle of search and pivot. And so if you think about the example I just gave with Steve and his students who, who had a drone and an idea, what they learned to do is instead of figure out the best way to attach a camera to a drone and fly it and get data, they learned to search for what's the real need this thing we initially call product market fit on the business side. And this is where we come back to the difference between customers and beneficiaries. The Farmer Joneses got to say, that doesn't solve my problem. The people who are receiving services on the other end of the disaster often don't have that choice. There's no time. It's not because uh, the people who are trying to solve those problems don't want to give them choice. It's because the resources are what the resources are and the resources that could get there are the resources that could get there. But we can do some things ahead of time to make sure we're getting the right resources to the right people at the right time. And so these two concepts that I wanted to show you here, all the way on the left-hand side when you're first starting to think about your ideas, IDO, a company out of San Francisco, really kind of put forward these ideas of human-centered design, which grew out of uh, actually the design school at Stanford, um, around started in the late 50s, early 60s, really took that long to mature through academia into IDO becoming a company late 90s before they were really formed to commercialize these ideas that are now prevalent across the industry. And then something many of us have heard of, but not everyone understands well, the idea of agile product methodology. It uses these same ideas of hypothesize, experiment, gather data and analyze, either reinforce and accelerate or pivot. Often you pivot. And that's one of the things that's very different about how we do things in government. And so here's my last slide that uh, I wanted to give. We'll have, we'll have uh, after this, uh, hopefully we have a good discussion about this. And then I'll have one other slide for us to talk about this more of a FEMA specific example. Uh, my experience in government is that this is how we do it. Maybe, maybe it's different in DHS, right? Um, but Someone gets tasked to solve a problem, they come up with an idea for the problem, and then you socialize it. You've got the answer. And then you go around and you figure out who do I need to say yes and who do I need to make sure doesn't say no. And those are the people you talk to, those people who sit around that big old table where all those decisions are made. And you say, well, what do you think about this? And you shape it a little bit and you add in some of their ideas and you hear what you want to hear and you move forward.
right? And so then eventually, as you start going through the process and you try and get these inputs from all these people, you're the one who's been moving this idea forward. So criticisms of the idea are in fact, criticisms of you. And there's no evidence. It's just a series of people's different opinions from the hats they happened to wear at that time. And you got them to say yes, or you recognize they were going to say no, and you need enough people to say yes to overcome them. That's how we make decisions in the government. In my experience, and we, I've always heard it, and I like to refer to the term as the BOGAT method. It's a bunch of guys around the table, right? It's a series of opinions from people who uh, have expert power or positional power, and they're the ones who are making the in, who are making the final decisions on whether or not your idea works. That doesn't work in industry. It simply doesn't work. The, the private concerns have the advantage of knowing whether or not their ideas were right because people do or don't choose to apply the finite resources they have to consume that idea. In short, if people don't pay for it, you don't have a company anymore. So your job is not to go out and socialize and get people to tell you they like your idea. In fact, your job is to go out and hypothesize and find those people who say, that doesn't make any sense at all. Because those exact same people are often the ones who will turn around and say, but if you did this, that's the idea of search and pivot because the if you did this gives you a new thing to hypothesize about, go out and test. Last point on this topic, academically, uh, we're limited when we can have students go out and engage people to do interviews. Um, so they interview the best people they can before class starts again. But there's some concepts in here that relate all the way back to Francis Bacon's work that are about understanding the population to which you are trying to generalize and taking the appropriate sample, right? So the way that I'll end this conversation is on that idea that the whole notion of science, uh, applying the scientific method in the business context that we're doing it is based on what Bacon did a long time ago and we've really um, stuck with over the years and understanding who the real population you're trying to serve is matters because if you've seen one electron, see them all. You talk to one Afghan elder, you talk to one Afghan elder. So you have to understand anytime you start engaging with people, which is what I would say FEMA's business is, then you really have to dig deep to understand how do you really know what that different group of beneficiaries needs so you can begin to test and find whether or not you can provide it. Okay, that's about as long as I wanted to talk. And so let me stop. Let's talk about these ideas of innovation. I'll have one more slide for an example and then we'll declare a victory. Thanks, Bo. It looks like we have some questions as well, um, if you'd like to um, answer those. I'd be glad to. I can't see them right now. Someone yeah, I can, I can read them to you. So okay. I know we did have one, um, Vanessa answered one, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to answer as well. And I just, before we get to that, just wanted to um, comment. I mean, I, I really do um, fully buy into this concept in, in part because I think we try at Napsig Foundation, we try to practice this. Um, not as artfully as you've just described it. And we have a very simplistic way of describing it as build it and they will come. We avoid that because that is presuming, you know, your market, you know, your, pro you know, the problems, um, you know, everything um, and, and we never do. Right. So our practice is to really iterate and try to understand the problems of our partners, um, understand that we don't know how to solve those problems fully. Um, so we work with, not only work with our community, not only to understand the problem, but to understand are we even on the right track for the solution. Um, so I, I love that a lot. I think it's a great, um, I love how you've laid this out. I think it really resonates with me. Um, so quick question, I know Vanessa has, has answered this, but give you an opportunity as well, is um, Hacking for Homeland Security more focused on technical products? It, for example, um, the example given here is power outage scenarios or is it more focused on planning and workflow for projects? So let me, um, I will say something to answer this, then let me come back and have Vanessa reinforce these. So let me distinguish between the program that Vanessa is leading in hacking for Homeland Security, Homeland Security and what I'm doing in H4X training. 
as Vanessa described it, the Hacking for Homeland Security program is a program with graduate students where we're looking for sponsors to bring in problems so those graduate students can learn the methodology, but also the people who bring in the problems will learn something about the methodology and really focus on real solutions. We could make up things academically, but that's not how you learn. You learn when you work on real problems. I am focused on training you. Right. The, the people that I, I look for are the workforce who want to actually apply these methodologies where they live and work right now. So that, that's the distinction in the two different groups that we work on. The, you just heard the examples that I gave are, uh, are focused. The examples I gave were focused on process for a reason. You're going to see the same thing that we talk about in just a minute um, with Hurricane Maria. But the, the methodology is really the same. Um, whether you're trying to solve a doctrine problem or organization problem, training problem, leadership problem, material problem, the idea of having a hypothesis, gathering evidence, analyzing what you gather, deciding whether or not to pivot, and then doing it over and over and over again until you know enough to make a decision is the same methodology that applies across all those spectrums. So long answer to a short question. Let me turn it over to Vanessa. Um, yeah, no, uh, that's actually part of what I was going to hit on. So thanks, Bo. Um, so to be direct with the question, uh, it is a wide range. If you go to that link, you'll see there's like, we've had topics from communications to energy, to technology, logistics, policy, process, uh, even workflowing, uh, definitely had that um, go under from like data to process, uh, personnel management, we've had some solutions be more of like, um, personality testing to identify who's the right person for the right job. So, <laughs> uh, you know, when we talk about innovation to Bill's point, it really is how do you just make whatever it is that you're dealing with more efficient. Um, and what the students do would be the process that Bull would tra could train you on. Uh, so how hacking for Homeland Security is a way to leverage a student team to sort of do the grunt work for you. Uh, but it, uh, going through this program doesn't actually teach you how to do it. You're interacting with the students to kind of guide them. Uh, they're going through that. They're going to courses to learn through that. Um, and so Bull would be uh, the kind of person that would uh, be that section that where you learn through it. Uh, and I know that you have an awesome example that kind of ties all of this together, especially to make it FEMA focused. Uh, but just wanted to make sure we answered that question. Great. And before we jump into the example, Bo, just one quick other question. Um, waterfall seems the preferred method in government just because of the budget process, RFP process. What are some recommendations to overcome this challenge? We have seen that to be an early adopter innovator when it comes to technology requires either a lot of money or a lot of staff time, both of which are lacking in government. Right. Hey, great question. And so we do things nose to tail in government because we started a lot of our management philosophies off an idea that was popular, really kind of peaked in the early 80s called total quality management. And it's eminently logical, right? Before I give you a solution, I really got to write down what the problem is. And before I can take the next step, I got to figure out how much it's going to cost. Well, I'm the government. I don't make things. I pay people to make things. So I got to go out get everybody to come in and tell me what they want. Now, keep in mind, if I tell everybody to come and give me a bid, I can't go back and change, but I said I wanted them to bid on, right? So I got to get that right the first time. Then I come in, I get all these proposals. I got to go through a very, very rigorous process to ensure that we're being fair to everyone. And I eventually got a lot of contracts. And contracts have six elements, but they all boil down to this idea. There's an agreement between you and I, you're going to do something, I'm going to pay for it. And we're not changing that something in the middle of it eminently logical. The problem we have is that we try and do it all in one step. Um, agile is improperly defined as a series of waterfalls. That's a mistake in, that's a mistake to understand waterfall, uh, excuse me, agile, because the underlying philosophy is really about understanding what people need. But the, the problem that we have in government is that instead of breaking the problem into smaller increments and understanding that there's a 0% chance we have it 100% right. And we need to learn from that first increment that goes out. This is why Steve Blank's modification of the minimum viable product is so critical because that learning allows us to come back 
and sometimes fundamentally change the solution we were headed for. Now, if you think about the PPBE, the planning, programming, budgeting, and execution process that all federal agencies are under, OMB Circular 11 Alpha, whether you're in DOD or DHS, you all got to meet those same requirements. And you do have to push that out two years. But that doesn't mean when you fill out your uh, documents for the Congressional Budget Justification Book that you can't give yourself enough flexibility, even in the year of execution, to learn from and make some of these adjustments. So the answer to the challenges we find in government is to apply Agile by breaking our problem solutions into increments. The reason, so if it's so obvious, why don't we do that? I'll give you a quick example, right? So. You're someone who has believed in this idea of Agile. You're, you're solving what you believe is a critical problem for the people that you have to solve problems for. And so you lay out, here's the end solution and here are the various increments I have to do it in. You put that in over a series of time, maybe five years for a program objective memorandum that we do in the Department of Defense. And then here's what somebody's going to tell you. Some gray beard who's been there for a day or two, he's going to put their arm around you and say, Here's what's gonna to happen to your program, right? So you got these five increments, you know, you know that guy up there in the budget office? About two years, he's gonna draw a line right through the middle of your increments and say, good enough. And that last half of stuff you say you think you need, you'll never get. And before you can even begin to argue, but that doesn't solve the whole problem, they'll say, but you already said you were giving something to the people who needed something. You fielded these first two increments you already added value. Maybe you can't gold plate it anymore, but you've, you've done enough. We'll declare a victory. None of that is a statutory problem. None of that is a regulatory problem. That is purely a cultural and business management problem. So even within the confines we have of our systems, when we take a hard look, we'll really find most of our wounds are self-inflicted. Agile can and has still worked. We have some examples of that across the services, but by far waterfall is still the method we use because it, it you're 100% correct, the person asked the question, it aligns so much more clearly with these processes because last comment, the, the person who designed those original processes was McNamara, right? That's where you've got this idea of POM and PPBE from what he learned at Ford. Ford grew out of the second industrial revolution. Henry Ford was famous for saying, our customers can have any kind of car they want as long as it's a black model T, right? So that, that's the methodology you had when you weren't in the knowledge economy, when there wasn't customer choice the way there is. That's obviously changed and our systems and government have not changed with it. And so that's a part of what Vanessa and I are working on is that groundswell. Um, look, I'd love to, teach your political appointees and senior leaders, that would be great, but it's gonna be an overview. What I wanna do is I wanna teach the next generation of leaders and some of them are on this call right now. Thanks, Paul. Um, do you wanna transition now to the uh, Maria example? Sure, let's give it a try. Okay, um, so this could be dynamic, right? So the, um, the, the one thing you always do in a presentation is uh, never never try and do public math, but we're gonna do it anyway, right? I'm not in FEMA, I wasn't a part of Hurricane Maria, but here in talking to the people I know at FEMA is an example where I think the methodologies that we teach could have mattered. I wanna be real clear about something up front. It is in our nature to say the problem is those guys, right? Those knuckleheads, what buffoon made this decision? I'm more of the opinion that people made the best decisions they could with the information they had at the time, right? So we just went through an example with a really good question talking about how waterfall aligns to what we do in government, because that's what we teach. We never trained anyone to do this. So we'll start talking about this, uh, this idea with uh, one of my fundamental axioms is that the solution to most government problems is usually a chainsaw. And so in Maria, what we see is we see devastation in Puerto Rico. And immediately FEMA goes into action. And one of the, uh, is it the essential security functions, the ESFs that uh, FEMA uses, it is, uh, has to do with providing medical support. So you know immediately people are going to need medical support. You start judging how much medical support they need. And I believe it's the USS Comfort that's on the East Coast and the, and the Mercy is on the West. So we deploy the USS Comfort. Now, some of the people I talked to in FEMA were like, great, here we go again. 
right? Um, we've seen over and over again, you deploy this ship, it's the wrong, wrong tool for the job. But you know what it is um, that I personally think is important is it's about giving people confidence that someone's coming to do something. It's more, it's the cynically, it's that way, you know, our leaders can, you know, look like they're doing something good on the news. That's not the way I view it. And the whole point of talking about the USS Comfort here is that problems are far more complex when you get into the human domain than just literally giving someone a fish, right? And so, the whole idea of being able to first let people know psychologically that we care and we're providing you this globally unique capability to try and meet your needs is the right idea. But then we send doctors down with it because we say there's a shortage of medical personnel. And when you start digging into the problem a little bit more, you definitely have people who need medical care. There, there is a shortage of people being able to receive medical care, but the problem isn't because there aren't enough providers. Right. Well, OK, but they can't go to the hospital because the hospital is out of power. So we, we need to get power to the hospital. They need more generators. No, it turns out that they didn't need more generators. They had plenty of generators. But yes, but those generators need fuel and we've got to get fuel for those generators. Now, it need you to ship more fuel from New York or another harbor in the United States. There was plenty out there on the barge. Problem was couldn't get the doctors, the people the fuel, the hospital, because roads were blocked. What you needed was a chainsaw, a bunch of them. So more chainsaws and chainsaw crews and the equipment to clear the road so that the fuel, the power of patients and doctors could get to the hospital to provide medical care is what was needed. So let's take a quick walk through how we could have gotten there from here is if we hypothesize that what are need is needed is more doctors, how would we have tested that? Did we have people on the ground in Puerto Rico who can answer that question? Or there's still people we were in telecommunication with, Puerto Rico, that can answer that question. And it's, it's nowhere near as simple as I'm making it sound. It's not a video game where you move your doctor icon onto the Puerto Rico icon and suddenly the problem is solved. No, you have to go through the detailed planning of where are we going to put what specialists in what, cap in what capacity and what parts of the country to do the most good. So you have to solve all those problems as you're going through this but if we solve the initial one of before we start figuring out how to make the thing right and assign the right skill set to the right place, got to answer the question, are we making the right thing? And if we'd have those skills to say, let's hypothesize and test and turn quickly. Again, we ain't, we ain't publishing in nature here. We're, we're not going to design a survey instrument over the course of six months and then get a thousand inputs. We're going to pick up the phone and gather evidence as best we could. Could we have pivoted to have a better understanding of what was needed at the time where it was? So last comment for me before I hope we get some uh, some inputs here. By, by the way, feel free to correct my understanding of what happened to Hurricane uh, Maria. I wasn't there. I'm re relaying what I understand from the professionals I talked to. This is, this is back to that idea that I think is uniquely important to FEMA and, and that notion of um, being anti-fragile. Uh, we're often criticized in DOD of preparing for the last war. Fair, right? Um, I, I don't think that applies to FEMA. I don't think anyone's applying for the last uh, uh, preparing for the last hurricane. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I think that what you learned from Maria when you went beyond the ESFs into the lifelines to try and take a bigger perspective view of the problem is the exact right lesson to learn but you're still not going to be able to apply the right capability, the right place at the right time, if you don't have the evidence that shows you what it is and that requires hypothesis testing. So that's the example I wanted to use to relate what we talk about with innovation back to an example of what the, the, the work that FEMA does to see whether or not it generates some conversation. Terrific. Any of the participants want to jump in and ask any questions of Bull on, on Hurricane Maria, his assumptions, their experiences? Um, again, we, we know this isn't um, a, a kind of a, a new experiment for us. We haven't done this for a few years, but uh, looking for some brave volunteers to help participate. And all you have to do is uh, raise your hand in the uh, bottom of the screen and we can um, unmute you.
right? We're 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 looking like we've got a shy audience today, Bo, and and um, uh, we'll we'll do our best to see if we can get anyone to participate. But anything else that you and or Vanessa want to cover while we're waiting for anyone to jump in? Vanessa. Um, no, not on, on my end. Um, I put in the chat uh, to answer one of the questions, uh, the website that we have with all the case studies and things like that. So, uh, you know, if you want to engage in a, a lighter way uh, with every, all the methodology that Bull just went through, uh, definitely leverage hacking for Homeland Security. If that later on piques your in interest in um, actually wanting to do it yourself, uh, definitely you can feel free to reach out to me and I can uh, forward you to Bull or, you know, obviously you go straight to him. Um, I mean, I personally am biased, obviously, because uh, I've drank the Kool-Aid on all of this, but uh, having used it countless times, it really is a way to help de-risk uh, the possibility of integrating a solution that works. Uh, and throughout the way, what I've found is, and what I love about it the most is that builds the the data for you. So when you make an argument, it's not about no one's fighting against you, they're fighting against the data, which helps build a case naturally. And uh, also kind of like a posse around uh, why this needs to happen. Uh, so as you're doing these interviews and like really getting to know the the ground level of the, the reality, uh, People are like, oh, you're actually doing the work. You actually understand what's happening. Let me know how I can help. And so that really builds a coalition, I would say, or like or if some people call them like a working group or however you want to relay it. Uh, so I, I can't speak enough to um, the approach as a whole. Uh, you know, logically, it makes sense. There's so much more <laughs> to it, uh, like sure. as you've seen. So we do have one question. Um... Uh, or comment from re relative to Maria. Um, one of the problems I'm reading the question. One of the problems I saw with FEMA in Puerto Rico was FEMA was not understanding that everything was connected across all sectors as far as data were concerned. You know, I got the same comment from one of the people that I talked to at the national level of FEMA is that, and, and they really worked. They really worked on that idea. Um, and is it CCI? is the system he told me that they have in place now that they try and bring to every problem to uh, at least achieve communications. They're, in, in the knowledge economy and in, in the fourth industrial revolution, there, there isn't a harder problem than a data problem, right? It, it's easy to talk about. You just pour two quarts of AI on it, it solves everything, right? The, I, I would tell you that if uh, it, I'm not shocked that FEMA would have a data problem because frankly, everyone has a data problem. And when you work in a business, you get the idea that you can structure the things you do and don't want to do. If you're Walmart, you're not selling John Deere tractors, I don't think. Um, you, you do get to decide what products you want to provide. And doing that necessarily means you get to control the data. Quick Walmart example, they almost put Rubbermaid out of business because they demanded 45, no, 45 days no interest terms. Now, Walmart will turn its inventory four times before they have to pay for the first set. And part of the way they do that is that if you want to do business with Walmart, or at least this used to be true, that in order to ship something to them, you had to use their codes, their labels, their system, because they grabbed that data and they were able to put it into their system and and very practically know what was on each shelf and when to order the next series of supplies. I don't think FEMA will ever be able to do that because you'll never be able to control the situation to that degree. So um, not shocked that there's a data problem there, um, but I think that that is, uh, I think that's one of the challenges you're gonna face that you can't use some industry solutions for. Yeah, and and, and both, it's actually kind of a great segue to the, a follow-up question and it's something that NAPSIG Foundation really tries to struggle, uh, tries to prioritize. And, and um, I know we, broadly as a public safety community struggle with at times. Um, coming, one of the feedback that folks have gotten from Maria, and I think you could substitute any other disaster, honestly, is that a lot of really great learnings and ideas that come from folks who are actually the boots on the ground, really experiencing the disasters, 
um, have they have a really hard time providing um, that feedback, you know, actually direct feedback as well as ideas for sol solving problems to the decision makers. Um, I know this process isn't necessarily designed for that, but I think it's a really interesting way to to help facilitate that that um, getting some of that direct feedback and as well as solution ideas to decision makers. Curious your reaction. Yeah, so it's. It's an interesting problem. And let me give you an example of why I think this process is designed for that. Um, it's a company you're going to hear about in about five days called Reveal AI. Reveal AI started out as Aurora. And Aurora was formed at BMNT because we thought we, we have a better way to figure out what customers actually need. So we went in and literally poured two quarts of AI on it. We built a natural language processing system to collect that information because surveys don't work well in this situation. So you've been the person with the boots on the ground. How do we collect that volume of information? Well, you probably need a psychometricist to help you design the right survey instrument. Then you have to take a population, which is usually already surveyed to death and get them to respond. Then you got to have the correct ontology so that broken doesn't mean damaged, doesn't mean destroyed. But if you use natural language processing, you can actually pull in very large samples of that data and let people describe things in their own way to start drilling down deeper into what's the real problem. So in that we, we we know that because we had to pivot about four times with Aurora to get to the company that's about to spin out of BMNT. I'm not trying to sell Reveal AI to you, right? And I don't even know that that would work. Uh, though, if you're interested, I'll give Robert a call. But the, that is an idea where the same notion of let's try this, learn, and pivot actually led us to solving the very problem that you've identified of how do we get that information. So it doesn't literally solve the information problem. We have to hire some really smart people to do that. But knowing what the right problem was led us to being able to get the people who could solve the problem. Yeah, that, that's terrific. And again, I think it's um, you could substitute Maria with almost anything, even in an auto accident on a daily basis. Um, so it, it, it's, it's probably... <laughs> Um, the biggest challenge we have in the public safety community is getting actionable information up the chain, but also then having um, solution ideas up the chain as well, and then having it flow back down in a way that is um, additionally actionable. Um, so really thank you both, Bo and Vanessa, for your time. Um, this is terrific. Um, it's something that, that NAPSIG Foundation really embraces as a concept, and we're, we really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you to our participants for joining and for asking questions. Um, sorry for springing on you a new model where we're going to ask you to uh, speak up, but um, you know we'll we'll continue to try to weave that into some of our prep tech talks in the future. Um, but again, thank you everybody for your time, um, and we really appreciate it. And as always, the recording for this will be available on the website um, probably next week sometime, as well as a presentation and analysis of the Q&A. So look forward to that um, sometime in the next um, seven or 10 days. Um, again, we'll sign off now, and thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye.